It is such an honor to be here. I can't tell you um, how great it's been to be in South Africa, to visit Johannesburg for a few days, and now to be in Cape Town. Uh, thank you to Chris. Thank you for Sandy for organizing such a beautiful, beautiful event. So my talk today uh, has two different titles. <laughs> it is about Shakespeare in blackface, um, but I'd like you to start thinking about it as Shakespeare in unfreedom as well. And I should say that I'm attempting to emulate my partner, Jonathan Hope, who um, gives talks without notes. And so I've been trying it this year. It's like so hard, <laughs> but I do have a lot of images, so hopefully that'll carry me through. <laughs> okay. Oh, and I should also say that this talk is um, incredibly American-centric, and uh, there are moments where South African history um, interject, and I would love to have a robust dialogue with those who know more about South African history. Okay, this is William Shakespeare. <laughs> This is the governor of Virginia, Ralph Northam, and this is his 1984 medical school yearbook photo in which it's unclear whether he's in blackface or in the Ku Klux Klan outfit. He did say that he thinks it's not him in blackface because later when he did perform in blackface, he remembered how hard it was to get the shoe polish off his skin. And he doesn't actually remember that from this 1984 moment, so he must be in the Ku Klux Klan outfit. This is the globe. <laughs> This is a poster advertising a 19th century American minstrel show where you get the white actor showing that he's white and then what he looks like in blackface. What is the connection or what is the relationship between Shakespeare and American minstrelsy or blackface performances? Uh, the talk is divided into acts. And I also realize that I'm used to giving this where there's a computer in front of me, so I'm seeing the slides. So pardon me if I turn my head occasionally to, <laughs> to figure out where we're going. <laughs> Act one. <laughs> um, techniques for performing blackness on the early modern stage. Um, as many of you will know, this is the Peacham drawing or the Longleat manuscript, which is the earliest surviving uh, performance um, archival material from the early modern period. Um, Henry Peacham went to see a production of Titus Andronicus, went home, drew this picture, wrote down the lines that he could remember. What's fascinating about it is that we do get a sense of some of the early modern performance techniques. So for example, while the Roman characters sort of have togas, they also look like they're in Spanish Armada outfits. <laughs> um, Tamara, the queen of the Goths, her outfit doesn't look too un-English. Uh, she's got a nice crown. Um, but Aaron the Moor, however, looks pretty distinct. We think, based on this drawing and from some other archival materials, that um, the techniques for performing blackness on the early modern stage included the use of wigs, and I think this is on the next slide, wigs, visors, gloves, um, stockings and bitumen, which is a kind of coal-like substance. Um, I do use the hashtag about citing scholars of color. I asked in Johannesburg where I had al an almost all African, um, black African audience if this is something that's important in Africa, and um, they all said, oh yeah. <laughs> so I'll say it again. Um, I think it's important to cite scholars of color, um, and particularly women of color, if at all possible. So, shout out to Farah Kareem Cooper and Ian Smith, who've done important work on this. So we see that the techniques carried over into the 18th and 19th century with actors um, who performed as Othello. I will also say now that this talk does track through Othello, and it'll hopefully become clear why I'm doing that. Um, but we see that Brooke, Salvini, Grist, and Keane um, all are using um, you know, bits of this kind of uh, racialized prosthetic that started on the early modern stage. The Great Bronze Age. 
how I wish I invented this phrase. Um, some of you know what this means, some of you don't. Um, let's just say it's that moment when white actors decided that Othello wasn't black. Um, we cannot actually trace back who came up with this phrase, but it's such a good one, so the Great Bronze Age. James Hewlett was a free black American who worked at the African Grove Theater in the very early 1800s. And the African Grove Theater started putting on productions of Shakespeare that were meant for their black audience, their free black audience. And he was known to have performed as Richard III and Hamlet and other roles. Um, he was mocked for his performances by the few white actors who were who entered into the African Grove. Um, by the way, the white audience had to sit separate in uh, the balcony, <laughs> which I think is great. Um, and we think that Charles Matthews, a British actor who visited the U.S. from 1822 to 1823, saw one of Hewlett's performances because in a play that he um, performed in afterwards, he started performing in blackface as a black actor performing Shakespeare. And he said that he came up with the lyrics for a, a Negro spiritual that he wrote called um, Possum Up a Gum Tree after hearing Hewlett perform in Hamlet. And the line in Hamlet is, um, we must oppose um, right? Uh, it's the kind of apostrophe E-M. And Matthews claimed that Hewlett didn't know what he was saying and was made the line a possum, which a, and a, a possum is a, a large rodent, basically. So he started, Matthews started performing mocking black masculinity and mocking a desire by black Americans to appropriate Shakespeare in this new performance tradition. Ira Aldridge also, we think, got his start at the African Grove Theater. He also traveled to England in 1833, yes, and performed at the Theater Royal for one night as Othello. However, he then had a long and storied career in Eastern Europe, where he was like kind of the toast of all of Eastern Europe. Um, it's 1852, that's him playing Othello. Um, sadly, after the Civil War, um, Aldridge planned to return to the U.S. and continue his acting career in the U.S., um, but he died before he was able to earn enough money, and he died in Poland, where they actually have a large memorial for him. Right around the same time, Samuel Taylor Coleridge was um, composing a series of lectures on Shakespeare, and here's a bit from his lecture on Othello in 1818. It would be something monstrous to conceive this beautiful Venetian girl falling in love with a veritable Negro. It would argue a disproportionateness, a want of balance in Desdemona. So in 1818, Coleridge is kind of setting the groundwork for what's going to become the Great Bronze Age when theater practitioners and scholars were going to argue that there was a difference between tawny moors and black moors and that clearly Othello had to be a tawny moor because there would be something wrong with Desdemona if she fell in love with him. Edmund Keane, who is performing at the same time, also came up with the same um, revelation. And his biographer, writing a few years after his death, claimed this. Sorry, I have to turn to read it. <laughs> Edmund Keane regarded it as a gross error to make Othello either a Negro or a black, and accordingly altered the conventional black to the light brown, which distinguishes Moors by virtue of their descent from the Caucasian race. I mean, again, you see this is like just complete crazy pants, like not, <laughs> there's no, like there's not actually any, you know, historical reasoning for this. Um, most actors, and I love this bit because it's actually acknowledging, most actors played the part with black faces. Of course they did, right? But it was reserved for Keane to innovate and Coleridge to justify the attempt to substitute a light brown for the traditional black. And this is again in uh, Keane's biography in 1869. Um, here's images of Keane playing different roles. I don't know if you can read the, the titles, but we get him as Brutus, Tunic, Legs. 
We get him as Richard III. Oh, his legs are in tights there, sorry. <laughs> Roya, tunic, legs. Othello, tunic, legs, right? So uh, th and not much of a color difference. So you see that Keane is, is operating in a, a tradition where he thinks that Othello probably shouldn't be as racially marked as um, Othello had been previously. But of course, the, the, the impetus for all of this were the black American actors who were performing at the African Grove. Okay, 19th century America. So for those of you who don't know, we in America have a rich history of what's called the minstrel show. And minstrel shows were played by white American males, men, who were um, burlesquing black masculinity primarily, although there are a few female characters that pop up in minstrel shows. And the idea is that they are mocking black masculinity by making it non-threatening. So these black men, you know, as the characters are, are people who aspire to be white, but in their aspiration end up becoming fools and there are lots of songs, and the banjo features heavily. Um, this is an image from 1855, just to show you that the female characters were per portrayed by um, white men as well. Now, the history, or the official birth of the minstrel show was started by T.D. Rice, often referred to by those who like him as Daddy Rice. <laughs> um, and he, said, he is said to have jumped Jim Crow, which was the performing of this new minstrel tradition in 1833 after a production of Othello. So the amazing kind of circular link that we get is that black actors who were successful performing Shakespeare in their own black theaters were mocked by white actors trying to make them look as if they were fools. And then at a performance of Othello, which is actually a play about a fairly strong black character, um, we get a white actor who decides to create a new performance tradition in which black masculinity is only something that can be mocked. It is not something to be feared. So there's this strange kind of circular loop between Shakespeare and blackface. Okay, so what does it mean? This is again just kind of a recap. Um, blacks parrot white behavior in these minstrel shows. Blacks end up looking foolish. And black men are non-threatening. Um, and I would c cite the amazing work by both Joyce McDonald and Kim Hall. And why is this something that white actors would want to do? Well, there seems to be, as Eric Lott, and I'm sure many of you have read his um, uh, great book, Love and Theft, um, there seems to be an immense pleasure that the actor can derive from impersonating another race. And the power, so often we think if, if you're in theater practice, you think about the, there's kind of a power balance between audience and actor. Um, and Dibna Callahan, who um, I think is cited on the next page, talks about how in early shows, there's uh, the power balance shifts when it's impersonation or exhibition, mimesis or exhibition. So this is all, of course, um, mimesis or uh, impersonation, that the power resides in the actor's um, control. And uh, there is power inherent in the Appropriation Act. <coughs> And virtuosity, and this is important and will become one of the threads that I will, <coughs> excuse me, draw through the rest of the talk, is that virtuosity is often associated with this impersonation. <coughs> Eric Lott's work is fantastic, as is Marvin McAllister's. Okay, what about blackface Shakespeare? So just so we're clear, Shakespeare's texts themselves were translated into um, minstrel shows in the 19th century. And I told the an anecdote at, when I was in Johannesburg about the fact that when I first went to the Folger Shakespeare Library as a graduate student and was asking the reference librarians for any materials that they had in the archives that would be related to race and performance, um, they did not reveal these texts to me. And um, 
I can talk about that history separately if you'd like, but I think um, many of these archival materials have been suppressed, uncatalogued, um, hidden. It's part of a shameful um, uh, past or history that many um, archivists are uncomfortable with, but I'd like to say we should probably reveal them all as South Africa shows us it's better to um, take responsibility and work towards reconciliation, which we're still <laughs> in the infancy of in the United States. Okay, so here's Desdemonum. Um, many of you may have seen this image before, but it's a minstrel pr uh, production about Othello from 1874. Um, here's one from 1850, where the drawings are after Rembrandt. Uh, I kind of love this image because um, the, the quote at the bottom is, uh, Othello, I took by the throat the circumcised dog and smote him thus. And then you can see the kind of, I think it's Iago and Cassio and um, maybe Lodovico looking you know, kind of unperturbed. <laughs> They're sort of like, hmm, okay, he's dead. <laughs> so again, 1850. Oh, these next two are, um, they're going to be from the same sheet music, from, but from different years, and these are at the Library of Congress. Um, this one is, when Mr. Shakespeare comes to town, or I don't like the minstrel folks, and it's sheet music. And you can see at the images in the bottom left, um, or bottom right, <laughs> that they are apparently a minstrel couple, so um, a black couple being mocked and looking for some entertainment. And they, again, are saying that Shakespeare is better for them than the minstrel shows, but of course it's minstrel performances. Um, notice that, uh, and it's Coon Song Chorus, notice that the, in the center we have a picture of, the, um, of Eugene Black, the composer, but in the reprinted edition in 1904, Shakespeare! He, re he replaces Eugene Black. Um, so again, it's the same, same sheet music, it's just a different image where, you know, kind of drawing Shakespeare into this narrative about when blacks aspire to something other than what they deserve or can achieve, Shakespeare's there. I think this ties really interestingly with what um, John Kane was just saying. Okay, so what about blackface Shakespeare? This is just white actors performing as Othello. So now from here on out, it's like Othello story. Okay. The father of realistic method acting. The father of it. Const <laughs> Konstantin Stanislavski performed in blackface as Othello, right? So part of the kind of learning how to really be in yourself may require blackface. Of course, everyone knows the 1952 Orson Welles film where he, of course, famously, you know, kind of um, tawnied up a bit. Um, Anthony Quayle in the 1953 RSC production where it's clear that he's channeling a more declamatory style from, um, you know, 18th and 19th century. Laurence Olivier's 64 version, um, which we, we heard mention of before in, in, in the discussion. Um, as many of you will know, uh, Laurence Olivier in his autobiography talked about how he followed um, young recent Jamaicans around the streets of London to mimic their gates and their ta the timbre of their voice. He deliberately lowered the timbre of his voice by a couple of octaves. Um, or, I don't know, not octaves, but notes. And then he used three different kinds of makeup uh, that he applied all over his body. And he says that he polished himself off with a chiffon cloth. If you watch the production, um, it starts with him in a full-length outfit. And by the end of the production, he's in a tiny little tunic. And I think it's inviting the audience to have a kind of scopophilic gaze and for us to ask how far does the makeup go. And Olivier, I think, wants us to ask that and wants to say, all the way, right? Famously, his makeup wiped off on, and John Kane mentioned this, <laughs> on um, Maggie Smith, but that was part of the pleasure of the production because in that moment the audience was able to remember once again that this is a white man impersonating blackness. Donald Sinden in 79, RSC claims this is the last blackface performance. 
I would challenge that. <laughs> Anthony Hopkins in the BBC, where I think it's sort of a tawny Beethoven look. <laughs> That's what I would call it. <laughs> I'm going to argue that this is still in the blackface tradition, Ben Kingsley on the RSC stage in 85. Um, and so we don't think that Americans are left out. Um, Raul Julia. I, I don't know much about this production, though I kind of can't imagine what Christopher Walken as Iago would be like. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> So performing Othello in makeup, and this is where I, I said Dimpna Callahan's work about the kind of pl the power that resides in impersonation um, and uh, kind of and, and the power that resides in the audience for exhibition. There's this pleasure of impersonation that we already know about from blackface. The power is inherent in con controlling the performance of difference, the power in appropriation, and once again, virtuosity virtuosity is associated with the actor who's impersonating blackness. That's where you get that strange um, imbalance that I will come back to. You can cite me or Dimpna Callahan there. <laughs> okay, so what about black Shakespeare's? Well, so I did mention Ira Aldridge and James Hewlett who were the harbingers, but for most um, most scholars thinking about when Othello as a performance tradition changed or shifted, it was with Paul Robeson in his performances in 1930, 1943, and 1959. You know, a very famous athlete turned actor, turned activist. Uh, Robeson was an incredibly powerful um, presence on the stage. But when critics wrote about him as Othello, they didn't use the terms that were often associated with the white actors that I just signaled you through. Virtuosity was not the term used. Naturalness was. And this is something that will continue to plague black actors playing Othello to this day. And I can say this with certainty because at some point, I don't know exactly how it happened, at some point I became the Othello whisperer. So when black actors encounter the role and they start to have problems with the role, I get called in by the theater companies or the directors or the actors and I talk them through why they might be experiencing what they're experiencing and I tell them this. I should actually bring this PowerPoint with me from now. <laughs> what you're feeling is not unique. <laughs> okay, so this is Robeson in 30, um, 43 with Uta Hagen and in 59 at the RSC. He had only gotten his passport back in 1957. Um, so his passport was taken away by HUAC, the House on Un-American Activities, because he was a communist. And so he was not able to travel outside of the United States because of his um, political leanings. So as soon as he got his passport back, the RSC said, let's have you here on our main stage to play Othello. And so this is, you know, 29 years after he first performed it, when he was really young and incredibly intimidated by the role. By the end, he was very comfortable with it. Um, Earl Hyman, um, some of you may remember from The Cosby Show, also performed as a fellow. James Earl Jones. Notice this is 1964, this is the exact same year that the National Theater is doing their production with Laurence Olivier in blackface. Joseph Papp, who was the founding artistic director of, of um, the public Shakespeare and Shakespeare in the Park, encouraged Jones to think about the new and burgeoning black arts movement and um, black nationalism as he undertook the role. Um, but uh, Jones refused. Uh, he said he didn't want to bring politics into the role. And I think that this is a stance that Jones still has. Um, his relationship to Othello as a character and a part is one of kind of uncomplicated love. Like he sees it as a love story. Um, this is a sort of um, one side of what one can experience. And this is the side that many black actors in training programs, actor classical training programs are told. They're like, look at James Earl Jones. He finds this an incredibly powering, powerful role. He was just at the White House with the Obamas. Oh, remember the Obamas? <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, 
reciting <laughs> a soliloquy from Othello. And so many black actors in actor training programs are taught to think of Othello as the pinnacle of their career. This is what they can strive for. And so many think of it in a kind of almost a teleological sense, like I know I will have arrived and good things will come when I get to play Othello. So it's quite a shock when they actually get to play it. And hence I'm called. Okay, there he is um, rep reprising the role in a different production. Oh, look, it's <laughs> Joanna Weinberg, who is apparently, that was quite, um, so I, when, I, when I put this slideshow together, I actually didn't know that John was gonna be on before me, so it's um, uh, quite remarkable. And the stories he told, I don't need to rehash, but just to say that I think it was frequently difficult for him to get to the theater, not just the one time for rehearsals. It was also, they, they kept having road closures because when you're in a state of emergency, you can just close down whole townships. And it was hard for him out to get to the theater. Uh, Lawrence Fishburne, Chuatil Ejiofor. Okay, now I wanna pause here and then have us look really carefully at the next few slides. So this is Adrian Lester in the 2013 production at the National Theater in London. Um, I was asked to interview Lester in the middle of the run and he was incredibly generous and we spent three hours together and he talked to me about this production. And I said, how are you doing? Because at this point I'd already, you know, I'd done my kind of Othello whisperer thing, so I was wondering how he was feeling um, kind of emotionally. He's like, I feel great, this is a great role. And I was like, oh, okay, tell me about it. And he said, well, you know, this production is all about a military experience. So you can see this is set in 21st century military setting. Uh, it looks vaguely like some outpost in Iraq. And he said, we brought in a general who has been um, on set to talk to us about post-traumatic stress disorder. And really this is about what happens with men in a war setting and their relationships with each other. And I was like, great, so you're feeling fine. And he's like, yeah, I feel totally fine. Okay, so good. Uh, two years later, <laughs> Adrian and I were asked to do a dialogue together at a, an event like this, um, slightly larger, at the Royal Shakespeare Company. Um, it was the World Shakespeare Congress. And we had a nice conversation talking about, you know, he was actually incredibly eloquent uh, talking about um, the um, actual techniques of acting that he employs and thinking about the difference between a camera and a live audience and blah, 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 blah. And then about halfway through, I was like, so do you want to talk about Othello at all? And he paused and he goes, I hated that fucking show. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> he goes, every night I looked out into that white audience and I could tell they were laughing at me and they wanted me to be tricked by Iago and they wanted me to kill Desdemona and they wanted to laugh at me at my expense and my soul died every night that I looked into the sea of white faces mocking me. And I was like, but when we talked in 2013, you were like, it's a military experience. And he said, that was the lie I had to tell myself every night to survive. He goes, I would not have survived the production otherwise. So there's something also, so it's not just the weird circular logic of white actors mocking black Shakespearean actors and then the pleasures of impersonation and then tying that into the larger history of, of Othello as a character that was created for a white man to play a black man. It's not just that. The structure of Othello itself is unlike any of Shakespeare's other tragedies. Othello is fundamentally structured like a comedy. It starts with a young girl running away from her parents. Oh, we've seen that in Midsummer Night's Dream. We've seen that in, you know, lots of other Shakespeare plays. It's a May-December romance. We know that as a comedy from Chaucer. Um, we also get a vice character who talks directly to the audience and tells us what he's going to do, right? And Iago's part is much larger than Othello's. So all of this kind of structural imbalance renders it quite difficult for the black actor who has been trained his whole career to think of this as the pinnacle, pinnacle of his acting career. 
It's very hard when that's your narrative to then realize, oh my God, I'm the butt of the joke. Even though it's a tragedy, right? I'm not trying to say it's a comedy. It is a tragedy, but the structure itself is unlike Macbeth. We don't know more. The audience, of course, I mean, I skipped over the most important thing. The audience is complicit in this. We know, along with Iago, what's going to happen. We know that Desdemona has not been unfaithful. We know that Iago is lying all the time. He tells us, and now I'm going to lie to him about this. Why? Who may, maybe he slept with my wife, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> it doesn't really matter, right? Um, when you're acting, of course it matters because then you have to make a decision, but um, for a reader or an audience, you can have it be ambiguous. But it's not like we know more than Macbeth. It's not like we know more than Hamlet, right? We're, it's not, we don't enter Hamlet being like, oh yeah, you know what, Claudius kills his dad. Like, we don't, we don't know that. We learn when Hamlet learns. Like, we're on the same page. Lear, same thing. You may not like his decisions. You're foolish for dividing up your kingdom before you're dead. But we don't know more than him. It's not like we can say, you know, Regan or Goneril comes out in act one, scene two, and it's like, guess what I'm going to do? <laughs> like, that's just not the structure of Shakespeare's normal tragedies. This tragedy is different. And that's part of what ends up being the weird effect for the black actor. Okay, so keep this mise-en-scene in mind. 2015, two years later, we get the same militarized setting. Now we have a black actor playing Iago, Lucien Masamati, opposite Hugh Quarshi, who, by the way, in 1995 wrote this brilliant article called Second Thoughts on Othello, where he says, no black actor should play this part, basically for every reason I just told you. So you should go read um, that essay. But he was convinced to play it again because Iqbal Khan, the director, was like, if we have a black Iago, things will be different. Well, I just heard from Iqbal Khan that things weren't <laughs> that actually Hugh found it very, very challenging and that he broke down a few times. David Oyelowo, uh, opposite Daniel Craig. Um, we saw this production in, in New York in 2016. Oyelowo, by the way, decided to take out all the references to race because he didn't want it to be about race. I think that saved him <laughs> in some way, but it was a crazy production. I wouldn't recommend it. Golda Rochevelle, I did not see this. This was a production in Manchester. She loved the, the be, being Othello. She said she had no qualms with it. But she also said that she was very particular working with her director. So what end, the other thing that ends up happening is that because Iago's lines are substantially more than Othello's, the actor playing Iago often gets more time with the director. The other thing is that you rarely ever get a director of color directing Othello. So the other dynamic is that you have white guy working with white guy while the black actor of color is left out. So many of the actors I've worked with talk about how they felt like the director was in league with the actor playing Iago and that they were getting short shrifted. Well, Golda said, she's like, <laughs> she said, I caught on really quick in act one, in you know, week one, that there was going to be a weird dynamic between them, and I cut it off. <laughs> so she kind of, I don't know, like, I'm not quite sure what her background was in terms of roles leading up to it, but she, she um, did not allow that to continue. But notice again, same mise en scène. Uh, okay, so 2018, Othello at the Globe with Mark Rylance playing Iago and the beautiful and incredibly talented Andre Holland, who is in Moonlight um, as Othello. I was called in by the director and Mark and Andre um, three months before it had been cast. So they're like, Ayana, we've heard that you're the Othello whisperer. We'd like to talk to you ahead of the game. What should we be thinking about? Okay, so I just did basically again, like, here's my, like, let me tell you the history. <laughs> here's why I would never do that play. <laughs> but if you're going to do it, here's what you should think about. And they're like, oh, it's really great when we talk to academics. Amazing. <laughs> so thoughtful. <laughs> and then they disregarded everything, every single thing, and it tipped into full comedy. And I can say this because the night that I went, 
when Iago, I mean, every time that Mark Rylance talked to the audience, they laughed. And the Globe is a tourist theater destination, right? So you don't get people who are necessarily there because they love Shakespeare. It's, it's on their list of things to do in London. And they, he owns that space, right? Like he was there from its building. And so he's very comfortable owning and leaning into the comedy. And he leaned a little too hard. So the audience, at lines like um, when Othello says in Act 3, th Scene 3, I think it's in 3 3, the temptation scene, when he's finally, he's like, all right, I'm going to kill her. And he says, I'll poison her. And Iago says, no, you should smother her in the bed. The audience was uproarious. Smother her in the bed? Yeah. I mean, there were actually applause. And I thought, oh my God, Andre had a full breakdown in the middle of the run. He broke down. And he's talked about this publicly, so I don't feel like I'm re uh, revealing anything. But it was, un and even though, and I, when I saw him, I was like, I told you these were the things that could happen. He goes, I didn't believe you. I thought you were one of those people who doesn't actually understand stagecraft. Fair enough, right? And, and many of you are theater makers in the room. And so you, you know that there is a tension between peop, people who make theater, practitioners, and scholars. There shouldn't be, but there is sometimes. And so scholars often get the bad rap of not knowing what it is to make stagecraft. And so he's like, we just kind of ignored what you said. And I was like, oh my God. So he, you know, he got through it. Um, I'm not, I think he took time off afterwards. So when you are a black actor or an actor of color performing as Othello, your performance is always situated in your naturalness. So you're praised for how natural you are as an actor. As opposed to a white actor in racial prosthetics who gets praised for his virtuosity. The power then resides in the audience's gaze. The audience is either against you or with you, but oftentimes if you're an actor of color in this production, the audience is against you because of the structure of the play. And the virtuosity, and this is the switch, gets associated with the actor playing Iago. So virtuosity then resides in Iago. And I wanna, oh, I wanna go back for a second. So, I knew this production was cast early on, and I wrote to um, Gregory Doran, the artistic director of the RSC, uh, who doesn't know me. <laughs> and I was just like, you don't know me, here are my credentials, you can click this website, I'm, I'm not a like crank, okay. I said, I heard you're doing this, I think it's brilliant, but let, uh, if you want to avoid the pitfalls of all Othello productions, have the actors switch the parts each night because then you can have a narrative about black virtuosity, which we have never had in our performance tradition. He didn't respond. And then I learned from Iqbal Khan that that email was not ever forwarded to him, the director, because he was like, oh my God, you're right, that would have solved everything. That was something that white actors did in the 19th century. They realized if you swap the parts that you get the whole more interesting conversation about virtuosic acting, right? And we saw this from NT Live for the, um, what is it, the Frankenstein? No, not Frankenstein. Yeah, it was Frankenstein, right? The Benedict Cumberbatch, Jonathan Rhys Myers. Um, but, you know, that whole, people went to see that MT Live over and over and over again because they wanted to make sure that they saw one actor as the monster and then the other actor as the monster and then they could talk about which was better and who had a more, whatever, virtuosic performance. That was available, but forestalled. Now, you know, granted, Doran could have thought I'm some idiot who doesn't know anything about theater, but okay. So what about whiteface Shakespeare? As some of you may know, Patrick Stewart um, played Othello opposite an all-black cast in Washington, D.C. in 1997. It's often referred to as the photo-negative Othello. Sounds great in theory. In practice, it didn't work well at all because of some of the structural problems that were put in place. Stewart cost so much money to cast that they had almost no money left to cast the rest of the actors. And so they 
had a limited pool and they ended up getting, I would say, actors who weren't as classically trained as they could have gotten. They also had a narrative about there not being any classically trained black actors at the time, which is just a fantasy. But um, the idea was there and Patrick Stewart has recently said that he wants to do it again. Of course he does because white actors are clamoring to play this part because it gets associated with virtuosity. And Bill Pullman um, recently in Norway, and I only know a scant little about this production, I did not see it myself, um, but the idea was that he, Bill Pullman is Othello as an American and he washes up on the shores of Norway and everyone else is Norwegian and that explains his otherness. <laughs> so again, <laughs> virtuosity, white guys get to, <laughs> get to be virtu <laughs> virtuosos pretty easily. So. I'll end with a few questions for all of you. What performance traditions are invoked in any production of Othello? Who gets to make those decisions? Who's in the room when those decisions are made? Who's part of the discussion? And what dialogues are, are enabled or foreclosed with the audience or the community about those decisions? I feel like we're at a moment where we need to stop the record, uh, pull the needle up and decide if we need a new track altogether or if we just want to clean off the needle or clean off the record or whatever to extend that metaphor. But <laughs> we need to make some decisions. We can't keep going in the same way. I mean, I'll get called in to be the Othello whisper over and over again, but I'd prefer not to. Thank you. Thank you.